Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The Committee on Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate will please come to order. It's Wednesday, March 20th at 1230 p.m. We are in room 1150 of the Minnesota Senate Building, and a quorum is present. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. We have a full agenda. We're going to start by handing the gavel over to Senator Zhang. Uh, I'm returning to the topic of Senate File 4784. Good afternoon, Senator Friends, to your bill. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Zhang and members. We return to the Minnesota Energy Infrastructure Permitting Act. This bill, of course, has already been before you, and I'm bringing it back today for three uh, largely technical amendments and then to send it to the Environment Committee. From there uh, to the Finance Committee, that's my request of you. With that, uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to offer the A13 amendment. All right, Senator Friends, to your amendment. Members, the A13 amendment uh, preserves the, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office language. Um, this is a technical correction, and I don't know if Mr. Mueller or Ms. Severson want to offer any additional comments, um, but since... That would be my request, Mr. Chair, that if we need further commentary, we can get that. Sure. Mr. Um, Chair. Any comments from members? Or I think Senate count, Senate staff has something for you. Uh, Mr. Mueller, do you, was there anything? You wanted to add? Um, any comments or questions from members? at this moment on the amendment. Uh, Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, could either the author or counsel um, give a better context of the uh, section this is amending and what the implications would be? Uh, Senator Friends. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Matthews. I'd, I'd like counsel to walk through it just briefly, please. All right. um, Senate counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, the A13 amendment is primarily technical and is just a, a technical language change to it. Um, One moment while I pull up the. Yeah. While we're waiting for that, uh, any other questions or comments on the amendment? Yeah, ready, yeah. Senate Council. Thank you. So, this is amending page line tw line twenty eight, page twenty nine, line twenty eight, and it's just changing some of the language in um, on this page to say that instead of. We're deleting must comply with the requirements. Now it shall say that the Minnesota State Historic, Historic Preservation Office shall participate in the commission siting and rooting activities as described in this section. Um, so it's just changing the language in a technical manner. Um, and then uh, page 29, line 29, it will now say the commission's consideration <coughs> and and resolution of Minnesota State Historic Preser Pre Preservation Office's comment satisfies the requirements of Section 138.665 when applicable. So it's adding just and resolution to that sentence there. 
Thank you. Uh, Senator Matthews, any follow-up questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair and Senator Frentz, um, what is technical about it if there was, uh, if we're going from compliance to just mere participation? That sounds like more than just a technical jump to me. Like, what was the original envisioned goal of their involvement, and why is this change to just permissive and participation just merely a technical adjustment? Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Matthews. I don't believe it's changed, at least in so far as I understand it. We want the State Historic Preservation Office to have a voice in some of this, and the language was suggested to us by that office and by advocates for it. If it changes the meaning of it, uh, I had not that, had that explained to me, nor did I see it clearly. Senator, uh, Senator Dibble. Um, I think I know the answer to the question, uh, but I'll ask the council. Is this me? Is that me? So I'm I'm wondering, Mr. Chair, if uh, or or council, when we insert the words consideration and resolution of Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office's comments, um, that that actually is where we see the compliance elements as opposed to um, having them comply with something that they can't comply with. Um, someone else needs to comply with what the State Historic Preservation Office uh, deems is important to comply with, and that's where we find the word and resolution. Ms. Severson. Yes, I believe that is correct. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, Senator Matthews. Okay. Um, Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a grammatical question here on uh, the amendment on 1.4. Line 29, page 29, line 29, if you delete, delete the first of, you've got a grammatically incomplete sentence there because it's with the requirements of this section, requirements of this section. Um, the way it is right now, I do believe is correct, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you, Senator Weber. Um, Senator Friends, any comments to? I think the chair seeks as much grammatical uh, accuracy as we can have. Sure. That's not even the right term. Yes, uh, Ms. Severson. Okay, so that comes down to a technical drafting um, point. So if you read it, okay. So it should read as, um, shall participate in the commissioner's citing and rooting activities as described in this section. So even though, no. so even though that instruction is on the next line below the instruction in the amendment, it, it's just a technical drafting. I'm not sure if that's answering your um, question. Senator Weber. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, Senator Weber, for that. Uh, Senator, for, uh, Senator uh, Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, my question is, uh, well, you know, in the last discussion, we seem to agree that the permitting process in Minnesota is quite convoluted, right? And this particular bill simply targets one area of trying to streamline it, and I do appreciate you taking on the, the task of trying to streamline the permitting process, uh, but would you be open to a oral amendment that, like on line page 5.5.3, wherever solar, wind, or energy storage, or fossil fuel, or nuclear, wherever that appears in the bill, you would add the words or fossil fuel or nuclear. Why don't we just streamline the whole thing, all types of energy at one time? We all agree. In fact, last meeting you said, well, we could build on this. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to build on it, and I'm going to give you credit. I bet you get a nice part bipartisan vote out of this if you do that. Uh, Senator Grunhagen, we're, we're still on the underlying um, oh. amendment, and I will get back to you, okay? Okay. 
All okay. With that, um, any other com uh, comments or questions on the amendment? No, but thank you for the questions, members, and asking for a yes vote on the A13 amendment. Okay. All of those in favor of adopting the A13 amendment, say aye. 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 All those opposed? The A13 amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Your Chair and members. I have the A24 amendment, the revisor's technical corrections. All right, the A24 amendment. Uh, Senator Friends, uh, there seems, seems to be uh, some printing error involved. Uh, could you go on to your, the, Mr. your next amendment? Mr. Chair, a printing <laughs> error? I'll tell you what I'll do for yes. you. I'm going to go on to the next amendment, which All is right, the, Senator A14, Friends. the A14. Members, notwithstanding the printing problems we're having here at the Minnesota Senate today, the A14 amendment um, is technical corrections that have been requested by the Public Utilities Commission and the Department of Commerce. I'm happy to have uh, any questions or commentary from council, but would ask your support for this technical amendment, the A14, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Senator Friends, uh, for the A14 amendment. Uh, does Senate Council wanted to add anything on the A14 amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, the A14 amendment is being passed out now, um, and it is, again, a technical amendment um, coming from the Department of Commerce and the Public Utilities Commission. Um, if there may be testifiers on the audience that would be able to speak to it better, but. All right. Uh, Senator Friends. Uh, do you have any testifier or anybody from the PUC? We, we have uh, members who could testify to the technical amendments from both the Department of Commerce and the PUC. I wasn't sure whether members wanted that, uh, but they are here if need be. Why don't we see if any members uh, yeah, are I'll, necessary. Thank you, Senator Friends. I'll leave that to the committee members. Um, Senator, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is three pages long and includes new sentences that are in here and is deleting a bunch of other lines too. So I think uh, if it is technical, um, I'd like to show your math on that and um, help us go through what changes this is purporting to do. Mr. Chair. All right, Senator Friends. I propose to have the Executive Secretary of the Public Utilities Commissioner, Mr. Stoyfer, come forward um, and, and walk through the technical. And I believe Mr. Kelly's here from the Department of All Commerce. Right. And now I see Mr. Emmerich gesturing at me, but I can't hear him, so I don't know what he's saying. Okay. Um, uh, happy to bring forward yes. as many testifiers to the, as you want. To the want. testifier, please uh, state your name and you may proceed. Uh, yeah, why don't, why don't you come? Yeah. Right, Will Seifert, Executive Secretary for the Public Utilities Commission. Um, and with me, I have my colleague, Mr. Barlow, from the PUC as well. Um, right. Can we answer questions? Maybe we might need a couple minutes with this. My apologies. I think we sent some feedback to the author but didn't actually see the amendment. So we're not organized to go through it in the way that you might want. So we can answer questions on the spot or if you want to bring us back in a couple minutes because it's the first time we're reading it. So. Okay, uh, Senator Friends. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And Senator Matthews, um, I guess that's a request if there are specific questions rather than a walk through of the amendment. Again, we received these uh, presented to us as technical from Commerce and the PUC. Um, if we're not able to respond to specific questions, I would still ask members to vote the amendment on subject to work later, but happy to defer to any members or any questions. And again, happy to have the Department of Commerce come forward with it. They will have much the same answer. All right, uh, Senator Chair, Matthews. Mr. Chair, um, if this came from Commerce, then can Commerce come and go through each step? Because right away, the first line is deleting the section that defines department in this bill as the Department of Commerce, which begs the question, what are we filling that with? You know, and that's just from the first line of the amendment. So some type of uh, walkthrough would be helpful. All right, uh, Senator Matthews. Uh, 
Do we have a member from the Department of Commerce? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Matthews. Friends. So I'm turning PUC loose here, Department of Commerce. We'll start. Um, thank you very much for coming. Yep. All right, uh, to the testifier, you may uh, state your name and you may proceed. Mr. Chair, I'm Louise Miltich. I'm Assistant Commissioner of Regulatory Affairs at the Minnesota Department of Commerce in the Division of Energy Resources. If I could also get a copy of it, that would be You got my copy. <laughs> to the testifier. Um, Chair. Yeah. Uh, Senator Matthews. Yeah, we, well, um, well, to the testifier, I think, um, you know, th the committee would like to s kind of see what the major changes are, what was the sort of the intent behind it, you know, the tech technical nature of it, I would say. Chair, I am not entirely prepared to walk through line by line, but I am happy to just kind of share the, the thinking behind the edits that we sent over. They were... Uh, technical in nature, just um, trying to reconcile different different pieces of the of the legislation and, and make sure that operationally the process can be implemented by the agency or or by the Public Utilities Commission. Should should the Energy Environmental Review and Analysis staff move over there to your specific question, Senator, about the delete of the reference to the Department of Commerce? Um, it was our understanding in our review of the bill that, that that definition was not, in fact, used further on in the bill. So that, that was the reason for that delete. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see other Commerce people that are sitting in the audience. Is there someone uh, in the room that's able to go through what the purported changes are here in the amendment? Because a lot of people are coming to the table and giving a collective shrug. Um, and I think uh, uh, this came from somewhere. This came from somewhere in your department, I'm imagining. And so whoever uh, proposed these changes should come prepared to tell the legislature why uh, they want these changes. Senator Matthews. Senator Friends. And Senator Friends. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, first of all, Senator Matthews, I think what Ms. Miltich is saying is that the deletion of the reference to the department is because it is not used anywhere else in the bill, which I think is a technical cleanup, which I support. Um, I actually can't see all the people behind me shrugging their shoulders, so I'm happy to have further testimony. Again, members presented as technical changes, but I think it's well within a member's right to say, tell me more about the technical changes. And with that, I don't know if Mr. Soifert wants to return on behalf of PUC or if we have other members um, who have questions for Ms. Miltich that might refer to a specific line. I don't know that either Commerce or PUC is prepared to give a line-by-line -line explanation. And right. I'm still going to ask for a yes vote from members on the A14 amendment. Sure. Uh, Mr. Seifert or um, member, anybody from Department of Commerce? I don't, I don't have anything further at this moment, Mr. Chairman. This doesn't entirely line up with everything we sent over, so that's why we need actually some time to look at it and respond. Um, happy to do questions on the spot, but we can come back, get this committee, and provide a little bit more information. But we do, we do need time to actually look at this and compare it with what we sent. Mr. Chair. All right, Senator Matthews. To the Department of Commerce on line 1.6 of the amendment, it's adding a new clause um, that seems like a policy change uh, to the section. Wondering if you could expound on it. I see there's a form uh, with applicants for, I believe, I'm, I'm, a, I'm assuming this is for citing purposes, um, and uh, written determinations and all of that. And then this new language is going to be this written determination constitutes a final decision. And that appears to, is, is that? Current practices here, is there no, uh, no process for any appeals or reconsideration of a site or we're just deciding one writing and that's it? Like this, these are the types of questions that yeah. come up as we're trying to comb through this amendment. M Mr. Chairman, Senator, I'm happy to, to take uh, that one. Mr. Seifer. That was us. That we, we suggested that. So this applicability determination is new law. Right now we don't have a formal process for an applicant to say, what applies? Do we do an EA, an EA? Do we do this permit process or 
uh, is this a permit amendment? So this is an opportunity for an applicant to get a, a actual determination, a written determination from the commission about what process to move forward. It's meant to provide clarity um, quickly and by saying that it's a final determination, then it's subject to some kind of judicial review. So this is really meant to tighten up a new step that doesn't exist in current law. Senator Matthews. Uh, Mr. Chair, then, um, I mean, I'm, I'm still a little frustrated that no one can come uh, show their work uh, with this amendment here. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask for a roll call on the amendment, urge members to vote no. We do much better work in this committee, uh, even with bills that I have disagreed with and have uh, argued against, uh, we've done better work for doing the work uh, in this committee um, with the crafting of legislation, with working through amendments. This seems very hasty, uh, no one's able to come explain to the legislature uh, what is going on with this. Uh, this clearly needs more time uh, to be able to come and give an explanation of what's going on. So uh, at this point, I would uh, urge members to not support the amendment until we get um, an actual explanation that we deserve. Thank you. Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Mathers. I agree with you. We have work to do on these bills and the committee. Uh, members, I'm asking for a yes vote on the amendment. I'm presenting it to you as technical, albeit not with the full explanation of every provision in it today. You have my pledge that if there's a something suggested, Senator Matthews, that's technical and proves to be less than that, um, that we will fix it. And that's my attempt to do here today is put these amendments on, presented to you all as technical, and keep working on it. Um, with that, members, I'm asking for a yes vote on the A14 amendment. Uh, uh, Senator Friends, do you have an yeah, additional sure. testifier? I almost hate to acknowledge this, Mr. Chair, but Mr. Kelly tells me there can be additional te testimony now from the Department of Commerce on the technical amendment. And if um, you're interested in that or members are, I'd be happy to have that presented. At All this right, time. to your testifier. I don't have it. I have it. Thanks, Louise. All right, Mr. Kelly. It's Mr. Kelly from the Department of Commerce. Um, to the testifier. Mr. Chair, members, um, apologies. There's a lot of moving pieces, and we are trying frantically to find the document. Um, so uh, for the record, John Kelly, Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. So uh, the reference, uh, as was mentioned, if fully revised and cleaned up, there's no references to the department, so we're asking that that comments out. Um, the lines uh, requesting to change uh, restore 216E.02, but edit to refer large energy infrastructure policy. There's no known basis to eliminate siting policy. Upon written request from the applicant, we ask to insert commissioner or designee. This should be an expeditious process, but the whole commission meeting would undermine that goal. So that's why we're saying it should be to the designee. Um, the, uh, the same uh, is for adding in its designee again. Um, on five, let's see here, um, adding large, uh, let's see here, um, is just, we want it, that's a technical correction to say, to add in large wind energy conversion system. Um, let's see here, for facilities, um, we, uh, to restore existing language, there's no clear reason to eliminate the requirement to provide this information. Um, let's see here. Uh, doesn't exactly line up, so I'm trying my best to, from what we sent to what was drafted by council, it doesn't exactly line up, so I'm trying my best here. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, let's see here. The, um, let's see here. Okay. It was lining up until it wasn't here, so. Um, okay, so here on, yeah, this isn't lining up. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess, you know, this doesn't line up exactly, but there's just consistently here throughout are just 
they are just lining up the bill as it moves from the PUC to Commerce uh, and, and just clarifying how things would flow. But again, like we can provide that offline, apologies. Um, but you know, again, these are just technical amendments. I don't want to take up too much committee time, but we do have, we can explain the amendment. All right, uh, Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, I'll flag one more for you. Line 2.5 of the amendment appears to be giving new authority to PUC employees, and I would like someone to uh, explain uh, the change in that part of the amendment. All right, thank you, uh, Senator Matthews. As we're shuffling along, uh, Mr. Seifert. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, this looks like it's just technical language to clarify that the authorities that staff at the department EERA had would be consistent with authorities that the commission would have to act on their behalf um, with respect to technical assistance. Uh, Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, maybe I can add a little bit for Senator Matthews on that one. Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews. As you know, the underlying bill proposes to move staff from the Department of Commerce to the Public Utilities Commission. I believe this makes it clear that they would move with the same authority um, to act once they are transferred, that we're not creating a new position or a new line of authority. So uh, there's no expansion of the authority that they would have or their ability to provide technical support to, uh, for example, an applicant. All right, uh, Senator Matthews. All right, with that, um, would, would you still like your roll call? All right, with that, we have a request for a roll call. Uh, staff will proceed with the roll call. Senator Friends? Yes. Senator Zhang? Yes. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Green? No. Senator Grunhagen? No. Senator Hoffman? Aye. Senator Klein? Yes. Senator Lucero? No. Senator McEwen? Yes. Senator Mitchell? Yes. Senator Port? Yes. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Weber? No. Uh, with that, uh, there being eight ayes and six nays, the amendment is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Friends. Mr. Chair and members, uh, I thought there was another amendment that I was interested in bringing, but then I heard the words printing error, and now, Mr. Chair, I don't think I am going to bring another amendment and would ask the uh, committee to consider um, passing the ball as amended and also the bill as amended to the uh, Environment Committee. All right. Uh, Senator Friends moves that Senate File 4784 be moved to... Oh, hold on a moment. Sorry. Senator Matthews, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just before final passage, I wanted to ask um, the chair or uh, counsel or someone about the fiscal note and what the plan is that we still don't have it here today. That was the reason for pushing pause on this on Monday, uh, and I would like an update on that. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Me too. Our new plan is that we're going to have to send this to the Finance Committee. Um, I was told the fiscal note would be ready today. It is not. I think it is possible it's ready tomorrow. Um, it is expected to be heard in environment tomorrow and instead of sent to the floor to be sent to the Senate Finance Committee, where if it doesn't have a fiscal note, uh, I don't want to say on the record what I might do. Senator Matthews. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Are you uh, interested in bringing it back to the committee after the fiscal note to have that evaluated? Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews. I believe I'm interested in having it go to finance instead of returning here uh, as it is going to environment tomorrow afternoon. I'd be happy to talk with you offline about those choices and try to respect the minority caucus vote. Um, having said that, uh, it was our intention to send it to finance where the fiscal note would be uh, reviewed at that point. 
Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, um, thank you. Um, I disagree with that position. Um, you're the majority. You have the Rules Committee. You have ways of passing bills after deadline that don't quite make it there. This whole process is showing on multiple levels that we're not doing uh, the work to the level that we hold ourselves to in this committee on a bipartisan basis. So um, I understand you've got another spot that wants to have it. Um, when I was a chair in the majority, we had times where we had bills scheduled and then had to pull the bills off because they didn't quite make it uh, over to our, uh, our committee, and sometimes that happens. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I am going to uh, uh, make a motion to lay the bill back on the table, please, and request a roll call. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Matthews. I do respect your work as a chair, and I think process is important. I'm asking members to vote no on the motion to lay it on the table. This is the second stop for this bill in this committee. The suggestion is it might be good to have a third. I think the protections built into the system and the opportunity to amend at its future stops are enough to make the better choice to vote no on the motion to lay it on the table and then to vote yes on the motion to send it to the Environment Committee. I'll be a no vote on the motion to lay it on the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews. All right. Uh, so there's two motions uh, being put on, but uh, first a motion to table, to lay, yeah. The motion, so this, the motion that we're going to take a roll call on is to lay the bill on the table. And with that, uh, Senate staff can begin the roll call. Senator Friends? No. Senator Zhang? No. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Dibble? No. Senator Green? Yes. Senator Grunegan? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Not nay. <laughs> Nay or I or nay? It's nay. It's no. Okay, no. <laughs> Senator Klein? No. Senator Lucero? Yes. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Mitchell? No. Senator Port? Senator Rarick? Yes. Senator Weber? Yes. Senator Port? There being six uh, yes votes and seven no votes uh, and one absent vote, uh, the motion is not adopted. And then to Senators, uh, any, any further questions or comments from the members? Senator Grunagan. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, in my zeal to try to make this a bipartisan bill, <laughs> I jumped in on that amendment. I apologize for that. Anyway, would you, the question is, would you be open as we, you know, in last meeting, we all agreed we have a convoluted, delaying and expensive and not efficient permitting system, especially as both here in the state and also as we compare ourselves to other states. Would you be open to an oral amendment to, uh, like on line point 5.3 on page uh, 5, it says, uh, subdivision 2, it says solar, wind, energy storage facilities or fossil fuel or nuclear so that we would apply these reforms to all of our energy sources. I think you would take a big step towards seeing a little bipartisanship rather than just uh, one party rules all. So would you be open to that? Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, this bill is the result of stakeholder work over several months by over 30 stakeholders, leading to a report that was submitted to the Public Utilities Commission in which that language was not chosen. And I want you to know, Senator Grunhagen, and I think this would make you happy, uh, those topics were discussed at length amongst the stakeholder group. Um, those that support the use of fossil fuels and nuclear, I think, would have been happy at the amount of time that was spent discussing it. Having said that, Mr. Chair, um, this bill reflects the report as it was submitted, and the PUC took the additional step of asking that the report be sent to the chairs of jurisdiction, me and the House Chair. So respectfully, I would ask a no vote on that amendment, or well, if your question it. is, would I be open to it, I'd prefer uh, a no vote on an amendment like that if it was brought. 
Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks for that response, Mr. Uh, Senator Friends. Yeah, you know, we each represent over 70,000 people sitting right here. And we're their elected representatives. And I think one of our responsibilities is to provide base load, uh, efficient, less expensive, and reliable energy. You know, we passed the 2040 bill last session. It was admitted by both sides we don't have the technology to do it. Uh, this would be an excellent step towards leveling the playing field so that we could get the most efficient, environmentally friendly, and base load electricity. Because we're heading down a path of rolling blackouts, which I, I documented last time I spoke, and high cost and inefficient, and to clean this stuff up is going to be an environmental disaster. So I'm willing to compromise and keep solar, wind, and and energy storage facilities in there, but I sure would appreciate, again, 70, 000, over 70,000 people behind each one of these people, and we got a chance to do it bipartisanly. 85. We don't have to do everything that, that the agencies say. We can do what the constituents actually need, which is base load, efficient, inexpensive energy, both our businesses and our constituents. So with that, members, I won't make that uh, uh, amendment, but I would seriously say vote no on this bill, that it only does one area. All right, thank, you. thank you for that. Uh, next, uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And You know, I've talked about this a few times. You know, there are a lot of other areas, construction, the construction industry, other energy sectors have been begging for permitting reform uh, for years. And, you know, I've been working on some thoughts behind how we would do an amendment uh, to this to, to bring them into this process. And I know um, you're, you keep referring back to the stakeholder group, um, but I want to have some conversations with you if this could be a bill that we could uh, also uh, use to get stakeholder groups um, started for all of these other sectors so that, you know, I, I realize we're not going to get that permitting reform, but if a group got together and can come up with ideas for permitting reforms for this sector, I believe that can be done through basically all state agencies for every sector that's out there, and I think this would be a perfect vehicle to put that out there, that those agencies should be uh, starting that process for all of these other areas so that we can be uh, having those discussions and then having um, hopefully some uh, bills and some votes in front of us uh, next year that can offer some of that same permitting reform um, for these other sectors. So we'd love to have some continued conversations with you and see if that is a, a viable option um, so that other sectors that have been begging for the same thing can start to see some progress along that line. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Uh, next. And Senator Green, our Senator Friends. Yeah, just a quick response, Mr. Chair and Senator Rarick. Uh, not only do you have my pledge that we should already be talking about that and how to get those stakeholder groups formed, uh, but when you and I served on the MREA panel yesterday and that subject came up in front of 300 uh, members of rural co-ops, I said, I think we should be working on that immediately. Uh, I would be happy to support discussion. I don't know if it goes on this bill, but you and I can talk about that. And I also think the question is, do we really have a committed group of Minnesotans ready to make permitting reform a priority in these other areas? I think we'll find consensus members in energy transmission and permitting. I'm a little bit more skeptical that we can find it in some of those other areas, but we should be trying. And frankly, we should be trying a lot harder than we are um, in some of those other jurisdictions that you mentioned now. So um, I would say heck yes. All right, uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Franz. Um, we, you know, we've talked before about how important uh, permitting reform is and, and that this, I think, is uh, uh, something that should be done across the board. However, we got a three-page amendment on this that there was really a struggle to try to explain, and I still don't understand it. I'll be reading through it and trying to get it all figured out. Uh, but my question for you is, this bill has now been heard, so it's met the deadline, I believe. What is the hurry about getting this out before we get through this amendment, and also, more importantly, uh, waiting for that fiscal note that uh, that's, should have been here, I believe? 
Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Green. As I always say, I agree with you. The fiscal note should have been here, but I understand the staffing issues, and I'm not criticizing any other members of state government. Just wish it would have been here. To your point about the timing, uh, Chair Herr has requested that we bring this bill to environment to meet deadline. I'm going to honor that request. Um, I do not think it has to spend a bunch of time in environment, but those that want it to be heard, including the chair, I'm honoring that. And for that reason, um, I think the best path is to pass it out of here and send it to environment to be heard tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, and then have it heard in finance. Um, but I, I don't begrudge your um, wish that we would have had a fiscal note. Obviously, when I sent it back here on Monday, that was my expectation that we would have one. I also think um, your points have been well taken about other permitting reform. I know that's been important to you. And, you know, I will not be the toughest nut to crack on more work on permitting reform in the other jurisdictions. Mr. Chair, right. so just, uh, just, one more, just one more question. Thank you. Uh, the, but it didn't really answer my question. Uh, you know, has it, it, it has met the deadline already by being heard in committee or, or is it not? Senator Friends. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, it has not. Um, again, Senator Herr has requested that we take it into his committee um, and would need to go to environment in order to meet the deadline, and that is our intention here. Senator Green. Uh, well, I, uh, I probably won't, well, I will not be voting for the bill. I think we need to get that before it comes out of this committee, but uh, I am hopeful that that fiscal note will be there by tomorrow so we can ask those questions in the environment committee. All right, um, Senator Weber and then Senator Matt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, earlier, Senator Friends, you mentioned that the bill has to, you know, should go to finance. Uh, we, it's regrettable we don't have the uh, fiscal note here. Uh, you know, the problem is you're the only member of this committee that sits on the Committee of Finance. So no one here is going to have, be able to make a decision based on knowledge of that that fiscal note. And quite frankly, I think that's most unfair. Mr. Chair. Senator Friends. Senator Weber, you know I respect you, and I think your point is well taken. Of the Energy Committee members, only one sits on the Finance Committee. I'm proud to serve as the Vice Chair of Finance. Having said that, both the Minority and Majority Caucus have some talented, hardworking members on the Finance Committee. I enjoy working with Senator Dames, Senator Westrom, <laughs> Senator Draheim. Senator Icorn and then uh, the lead, Senator Pratt. And let me tell you, Senator Pratt is quite vocal. If you bring your concerns to him, I assure you they'll be heard in spades, as you know, in the Finance Committee. Senator Matthew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Senator Weber said um, part of what I was exactly going to say. And believe me, Senator Pratt is about to hear concerns from the uh, members of this caucus because the committee is the Finance Committee. The committee is not the Finance and Energy and Utilities and Environment and Climate Committee. Uh, we were set up to specifically tackle this issue and we're doing an end around uh, of that process, even from what was stated on Monday that the uh, goal on Monday was for this committee to do the work, and the goal, the, uh, the, that narrative changed in the last two days to now we do not want this committee uh, to do the work, and we're going to have another committee uh, do our work for us, which is uh, absolutely not the way uh, that this committee should be operating uh, our business. Uh, and this, this whole process today showed this bill is not ready to go to the Environment Committee. This bill is not ready to go to the Finance and Energy Committee because we can't even fully explain the work that we need to do here in the Energy Committee. Um, so I am going to ask for a roll call on this motion uh, and urge members uh, to vote no. As I stated before, the majority has a million different ways to get their priority bills out of committees and to the floor and passed, even after deadlines. I know it because that's what happens. That's what the practice is on both sides. This has been identified from early on as one of the priority uh, agenda items for this committee. And so they have uh, ample ways to allow this committee to do our work and still have this process completed through the rest of the committees and the floor vote. So uh, this, is, this is making a mockery of the, uh, the situation and the work that we need to do in this committee 
Um, since we didn't table uh, the bill earlier, uh, I'm going to ask for a no vote on this motion to re-refer. Thank you. Senator Friends. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Mathers. While I wouldn't use the word mockery, I would agree this is less than ideal. However, having served both in the minority and the majority, um, this is the process that the author is asking for the members to vote for. And I think you know from our laying over the bill in the committee on Monday of a different author on a different topic that I do want to have voices where possible. In this case, I think the better approach is to send it to environment. And you know, Senator Matthews, that you and I will be able to talk uh, as many times we want and that when the bill has the opportunity to be amended, that those points will be made. Having said that, members, I renew my motion that we send this to the Environment Committee with a recommendation to pass and look forward to further work on the bill. All right. Thank, thank you, Senator Friends. Uh, Senator Friends, again, moves uh, for Senate File 4784 to be moved to the Environment Committee and as amended. And uh, with that, staff will take the roll. Senator Friends? Yes. Senator Zhang? Yes. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Green? No. Senator Grunhagen? No. Senator Hoffman? Yes. Senator Klein? Yes. Senator Lucero? No. Senator McEwen? Yes. Senator Mitchell? Yes. Senator Port? Yes. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Weber? No. All right, there being eight yes votes and six no votes, the motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Members, next we have Senate File 4742. This is Senator McEwen's bill, the aforementioned bill that we laid over. Um, Senator McEwen, I understand before we start discussing the bill that you have an amendment. That is correct, Mr. Chair. I have the A2 amendment. Senator McEwen moves the A2 amendment. Copies are being passed out, members. Senator McEwen, to the amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Members, as um, the discussion from the other day uh, informs us, there is a, a coalition of people and um, some people bringing concerns, some people wanting to move this forward, um, and a lot of discussions have been happening over the last 48 hours. We're really happy with how those discussions are going. Uh, this r amendment, the A2, reflects uh, some of those uh, issues uh, that we have been discussing and some um, compromises that have been uh, adopted to try to move this bill along. Um, I'm not going to pretend that there is perfect agreement on the bill yet. There is not. Um, however, the discussions have been very productive and very promising. Uh, we hope that this amendment reflects the spirit in which those discussions are happening and that um, all parties are ready to continue this discussion in the hope and trust that we will be able to come to an agreement and, and pass some legislation this year that addresses uh, what this bill is trying to do. So uh, you can see the, the specific items on the amendment. I won't go into too much detail, but um, we want to make sure that it's crystal clear that uh, the proponents of this bill are very much invested in and want to receive the full amount of federal funding that is coming uh, to us to do this broadband build out. Very excited about that and we wouldn't in any way wish to hinder that. So some of the language reflects that and um, also just added some more inclusive language to make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Uh, members, questions for the author or comments to the A2 amendment? Senator Grunhagen and then Senator Matthews. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Senator McEwen, for bringing this amendment. It just, I guess I would ask uh, legal staff, you know, when it says in here, the commissioner shall, ha shall have authority not to enforce or apply any requirement of this section to, this, to the extent that such requirement would prevent the state from receiving federal broadband grant funding. And we're talking about $650 million. Uh, so is there anything in statute that would assure us that the commissioner will apply these funds in a way that the concerns brought up in the past by uh, ABC, MCCA, and uh, US Telecom, by those organizations, that they would be eligible for the, to participate in putting in the broadband. They do have a good safety record, according to last uh, discussion. And uh, so is there anything in statute that would allow them to participate on a level playing field, uh, given this uh, amendment. Senator Grunhagen, thank you. We're on the A2 amendment, so you would like Senate Council to address your question within yeah. the context of the A2 amendment? In other, maybe I sh should uh, make it a little more succinct. Does this amendment, based on state statute, allow the concerns that were brought up by these other organizations that I just quoted, an equal opportunity to receive part of the $650 million to put the broadband in. The, um, I, in other words, I don't necessarily trust the commissioner unless he has some legal authority to force him to do it that way. Just wondering. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. We'll go to Ms. Severson uh, to attempt to answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Grunhagen, or Senator Grunhagen. I don't know off the top of my head if there is statute, if there's someone in the, you know, from the agency that has that answer off the top of their head, um, maybe they can come forward. Otherwise, I will try and find an answer for you. I just don't okay. know off the top of my head. Senator Grunhagen, do you want me to go to the author? No. Well, sure. All right. <laughs> Senator Grunhagen. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator uh, Grunhagen, for the um, question. You know, since the last uh, time we appeared a couple of days ago at this committee, there have been a number of conversations among stakeholders, and that includes LIUNA, uh, Deeds Office of Broadband Development, the Minnesota Rural Electric Association, the Minnesota Telecom Alliance, the Minnesota Cable Communications Association, and other members of the Broadband Task Force. Uh, a lot of good, good discussion, and we have made in a progress in a number of areas, but as I said before, there is more work to do. And certainly we, we don't mean to say that this amendment is comprehensive in, in, in providing the peace in the valley that we're all so fond of. Um, but, we, but we are making significant progress and we believe that we will get there. Uh, and I've already engaged uh, with the agriculture community, our agriculture committee, uh, where this bill is headed next and look forward to some more discussions with more stakeholders as we move forward. Thanks, Senator McEwen, Senator Grunhagen, and then we're going to Senator Matthews, and after sure. Senator Matthews, Senator Green. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just a follow-up comment. I appreciate you bringing this amendment forward and working on this, Senator McEwen, and I hope, you know, here's the thing I see up here, and it doesn't necessarily just apply to this bill or this amendment, but to- uh, Senator just, Grunhagen, just a reminder that we are on the amendment, and so hopefully okay. our comments here would be limited to the A2 with a promise of ability to comment on the larger picture once okay. the A2 amendment's addressed. Senator Grunhagen. I stand corrected. Uh, <laughs> I've been married for 48 years, so I'm used to that now. <laughs> anyway, the, um, I guess I just, re you know, as elected representatives of our districts, uh, all of our districts, whether it's Democrat or Republican. I think when we do federal grants or even state grants, to the degree that we can create a level playing field, so people who are capable of doing an excellent job, and I'm the first one to say, if there's a safety problem, if the company's not operating correctly, okay, then, and, and we've got that documented, then I'm all for excluding them. But otherwise, whether they're union, non-union, 
uh, we're all Minnesotans, let's create a level playing field so they have equal opportunity to apply for these grants. It's $650 million of our tax dollars, and I'm sure some of it was paid in by all the companies. So I just encourage you to continue down that road, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Grudenhagen. Senator Matthews, and then we'll go to Senator Green. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my ask would be, if there's anyone in the audience that testified uh, with concerns to the bill last time, uh, a, a member or representative from that could come and share thoughts on the A2 amendment and uh, what the nature of the conversations and engagement has been uh, since the last time this bill was heard. Senator Matthews, I think that's a reasonable inquiry. Um, are there members of the public who are here who want to come forward and testify on the A2 amendment? Um, folks, we're trying to move this amendment or defeat it if that's to be the case. If you're here and want to testify about those conversations Senator Matthews talking about to the A2, you would be invited to testify for a couple minutes. It is not required that a member of the public testify to an amendment, but if you are here and want to come forward, it's clear one member would like to hear from you. If you're interested, please stand up and come running forward to the testifier's table. <laughs> um, seeing none, we'll return uh, to Senator Matthews. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator McEwen, so um, who all did we engage then in the last couple of days? Like, and why aren't, why aren't the people that were engaged then here today to talk about this, uh, this proposed, at least partial resolution? Thank you, Senator Matthews. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews. I think the better question is who wasn't engaged over the last couple of days. Pretty much all of the stakeholders who have any stake in this have been in conversation together, in meetings with me, in meetings with one another. And um, as I said, I think that uh, the, the, the reflection is that the conversations are good and they're ongoing and there's really not a sense that we want to hold things up right here. We actually want them to move forward and the conversation to continue because things are looking promising. And while there are still some big things that we're going to have to uh, work out together in conversation, I think, I think it reflects that just there's a lot of faith in that this is a good process and these are good conversations that deserve to move forward. Um, thank you, Senator McHugh and Senator Matthews. If it's uh, at all at help, I personally engaged also with Layuna, MREA, who's having their annual convention downtown and couldn't be here, Telecom Cable. They were engaged, um, and the amendment represents some of their progress, although not total in my opinion. Um, thank you. Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, and that's, that's partially why I wanted them here. I mean, it's, it's a trust but verify um, stance for me. And also, I want to know, what kind of partial? Does that mean that they're fully supportive of this language, they just wish there was additional language and additional steps in? Or does this language here maybe only go halfway to, you know, halfway to what they want? There's a couple different ways that this could be a partial resolution. That's what I wanted some feedback on. And I only got half my question answered as to, you know, as to why, um, why we don't have members here that are ready to discuss the result of, of the uh, negotiations from both sides. First of all, uh, Senator Matthews, very fair question. You know, when the committee says, hey, you guys go work it out, we expect some testimony about how it's worked out and if it's only a partial or 75%. Um, I think that's a fair question for a member to ask, and that may bear on a member's vote on the amendment. Having said that, I thought we had a testifier standing mm -hmm. by the table, Mr. Mendoza. Um, Mr. Mendoza, hearing our discussion about the A2 amendment, thank you for stepping forward. Um, we're on the A2 amendment, but I think Senator Matthews' question is, are you able to offer any additional information about um, what's in the A2 amendment and how it reflects on the goal to find agreement if possible? Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tony Mendoza, outside counsel to the Minnesota Cable Communications Association. Um, we, we did meet with Senator McEwen and some of the other stakeholders on this bill um, right after this hearing uh, on this bill last at the last hearing of this committee. Um, this is the first I've seen the language on the A2 amendment when it got handed out. Um, I have to say that it does not address our concerns of our uh, uh, equal opportunity to participate in this program. 
We are very interested in continuing to engage on this bill uh, with Senator McEwen and the other stakeholders. Um, we have other concerns beyond uh, uh, this particular section that we've raised with the other stakeholders, and we look forward to having those conversations going forward. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. And again, we're on the A2, so your testimony is appreciated insofar as the A2 is before the committee. We're going to go back now to Senator Matthews, to the A2. Senator Matthews. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate that. So um, I, uh, this bill still has more work to do. That's the uh, long and short of it. And I wonder, you know, is there is there any agreement or any progress uh, that's made with the language here? Is this just an attempt to try to help? Um, but we're hearing that uh, we don't have pretty much any of the concerns addressed that was the reason for wanting us to keep working on this uh, back on Monday. So um, I'm... Last time we did this, Mr. Chair, we asked the uh, we asked for the bill to be put on pause for the people to go back and talk. They came back with a successful report and a good resolution for how the bill needed to proceed forward. We don't have that with this bill, and I'm asking that we do that again uh, to give people an opportunity to try to come to a resolution on this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Uh, before us, members, is the A2. Um, once we resolve the question of the A2 amendment, I think any members able to bring any motion related to the underlying bill. Before we move on, Senator McEwen, um, any thoughts? I have Senator Green next to comment. Senator Green, you're off the list? Okay. Um, other members who wish to testify, once again, we are on the A2 amendment. All right, seeing none. Senator McEwen, any final comments before the committee votes on the A2? No, um, just to respectfully ask for your support. Senator Dibble, do you want to comment? Mm -hmm. uh, members... The motion before the committee is on the A2 amendment. All in favor of adopting the A2 amendment say aye. 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 All opposed? No. The amendment is adopted. Senator McEwen to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, um, so I think that I've uh, pretty much said all, all that I need to say on the bill. The committee is familiar um, with um, what the bill does, the overall uh, work that we're trying to do with this bill. And um, I, I can't stress enough how much I appreciate all of these stakeholders engaging um, in good faith to get us to where we, we want to go. We want to make sure that this large infusion of resources from the federal government toward our broadband infrastructure this is this is a, a point of inflection where we make some decisions about how we're going to do this and we just really want to make sure that the way that we're doing this provides excellent middle class jobs for Minnesotans that the work is done safely that the work is done with the public safety and worker safety in mind we know that there's excellent work being done right now and a lot of the stakeholders who've testified already um, have have done some excellent work and we just want to continue that and encourage it as much as possible so again I respectfully ask for your support as we continue these discussions and um, look forward to a good final product to present to the Senate thank you very much Senator McEwen all right we next have uh, speakers to the bill as amended I have Senator Rarick Senator Lucero and Senator Grunhagen. We will start with Senator Rarick. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, to the chief author. In your discussions that you've been having, have there been any talks about uh, groups that are currently uh, under a plan? Um, I have a, a cooperative uh, that for years uh, the local people have been begging them to uh, get into the broadband business because they've seen cooperatives um, that have done this and been very successful. A couple years ago, they agreed to do it, and they've worked out a plan. They're going to be investing $350 million and bringing fiber to every home within their service district. Yes. Um, is the, but as they looked at this, the, their plan is in place, and this would delay and change their entire plan. Have there been talks about uh, 
groups that already have plans in place um, to be able to potentially be exempt or a way to work with this so that it does not uh, ruin their plans and, and delay um, what they have in place, which would ultimately delay broadband getting out to their customers. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rarick, for that question. In short, yes. Um, we're in discussion with MREA and all of the other stakeholders about narrowing the scope of the proposed workforce best practices within the bill um, initiative with the goal of ensuring that it's feasible for current providers participating in the program, especially cooperative um, and other nonprofit providers operating in rural Minnesota. And there's a, a number of ideas that are under discussion to, to meet those concerns. Senator Rarick. Senator Rarick's good. Next, we have Senator Lucero. After Senator Lucero, Senator Grunhagen. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for this discussion. After the amendment was adopted, there is a line in here that was uh, 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 added to. It was line... Page two, line 27. So I, I read that paragraph here. And one of the things it discusses is in regards to, as I read the entire page, uh, grant uh, awarding preference. And it goes in to say that one of the preferences is going to be or shall be uh, evaluated is the credible evidence of support for the application and applicant's workforce needs. And then it, it says, that it has a track record of representing and advocating for workers or recruiting, training, and securing employment of people of color, indigenous, uh, women, et cetera. My question is, in regards to the protected class, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is uh, discrimination in the state of Minnesota. And how, can you just help me understand, how does an applicant recruit or secure employment without violating, deliberately violating the protected classes of not discriminating based on sex, race, national origin, et cetera. Senator McEwen. I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Lucero. Um, the question was asked in sort of a double negative form. Can you, can you just uh, repeat your question so I make sure I understand what you're asking? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lucero. In, in the state of Minnesota, we have protected classes that we cannot discriminate based on race, color, national origin, uh, sex, et cetera. And then I see here that preference is given to those that are securing employment for people of color, indigenous, and women. How does an applicant satisfy this criteria without being in violation of discriminated discrimination and protected classes. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. I don't think that they would be in violation. I guess um, you know, I invite you to set up an appointment. We can talk this through. I'm happy to take a look at it. And if there's some sort of um, comfort language that could be added to the bill that would alleviate your concerns, I'm, I'm more than happy to look at it. I, I, I guess I, I'd want to take a little bit of a deeper dive and get some advice from perhaps some of our research staff and attorneys uh, specifically to your concerns so that I understand whether um, those who specialize in this area would share your concerns and if they do, what they feel would be the best remedy for that. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, my advice would be to strike this language. In order to actually evaluate applications based on their ability, applicants based on their ability to perform the, the work at the most cost effective and efficient manner, to not have language in here that very, very closely resembles discrimination. Having this language in here, which it appears to give uh, a discriminating uh, opportunity against applicants or for applicants based on color, sex, et cetera, I think this language should be stricken from the proposal and we just stick to the, the protected classes uh, language that already exists in the human rights statute. So that would be my advice, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. We are now going to go to Senator Grunhagen. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, I guess, you know, I'll make my general comment. What, you know, I've watched politics a long time, even before I was a legislator, okay? And one of the things you start to understand 
is that sometimes the legislative process is used to favor certain groups over other groups. That doesn't actually say that in the legislation, but when you look at the, the wording in the legislation, you begin to under, and also you listen to the testimony like we did before, you begin to understand that sometimes uh, they want to use government to create them a favor in terms of some of the grant money or the money that's available versus other groups when they're in the same industry. And, you know, Senator McEwen, I respect you. You're capable. I'm on two committees with you and uh, appreciate you. And I know you, you want to do what's right, just like uh, all of us do. But again, I would just beseech you to work with those groups, whether union or non-union, to create a level playing field based on safety and ability to install this broadband, which is desperately needed by a lot of areas in the state of Minnesota. And I, I think we'll be doing a service to our constituents if we allow all hands on decks who are uh, qualified to do this work. And based on the testimony we've heard here, uh, there's some groups that think they're being excluded through the language. So I would, I appreciate you're going to continue working with them, but uh, that would be my, for today I'm going to have to vote no, but uh, I will be open to seeing how this comes out. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. We'll go now to Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to either you, Mr. Chair, or to the author, are you planning to try to return this bill back to this committee after further work with the stakeholders has been done? I have an answer to that, but first to the author of the bill, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question, Senator Matthews. Um, I, I do not know the answer to that question, Mr. Chair. I would defer to you. Um, thank you, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Um, I, I thought we needed 48 hours to work on the bill and to try to see agreements. We do not have full agreement in front of me. As a courtesy to the author, I told her that I would be willing to consider voting it to agriculture, and that would be the extent of my promise, and I did not promise any other DFL members or their votes on the motion to send it to agriculture. Having said that, I think the minority is entitled to ask some of these questions about what deal is and what deal is not reached and vote accordingly. Thank you, Senator. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, you know, when we read through this bill on Monday, my reading of it was this was going to, at the very least, slow down and possibly uh, limit the amount of broadband that we'd be able to build in Minnesota if we pass this language. Uh, that's, and there were a lot of concerns that were raised about that, and it's limiting a lot of the money uh, that won't be available for these build-outs unless we meet a new list of government criteria. That raised a lot of concerns, so we gave a couple of days uh, to try to work on the concerns. We're here a couple days later, and I have no evidence of any progress that's been made uh, in trying to address these concerns. Um, and this committee, again, is are we, are we just going to keep passing things out without doing the work that we need to do uh, in this committee? Uh, otherwise, if there's no more, conver if you decided you're at an impasse and you're just going to pass the bill over the disagreement of a bunch of the stakeholders that are actually helping to build out uh, these infrastructure in Minnesota, uh, then that should be the report and then we're a yes or a no on the bill and, and uh, we have to move on after that. But. This is turning into a habit today of we're not doing the work to the level that we expect uh, out of this committee, and we're not even willing to promise that we'll bring it back, because I know it's, it's deadline week, it's not sloppy work week. We're not even willing to say, well, we'll come back to review in this committee uh, what progress we do make that's on this. So uh, I am I'm really disappointed uh, with this process, uh, I'm going to ask for a roll call on this motion and ask members to vote no, uh, because we've not, we've not made any uh, meaningful or concrete progress on this. There's definitely more that needs to be done uh, in order to get bipartisan uh, work done out of this committee. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Um, the motion is to recommend the bill to pass and be sent to the Senate Agriculture Committee 
Um, before we address that motion, Senator Matthews moves for a roll call. Roll call is requested. Roll call is granted. Uh, members, here's what I'm going to do here. Um, Jenny uh, Glumek from the Minnesota Rural Electric Association is going to come forward and describe for members the progress that has been made and discuss, Senator Matthews, any work that's remaining to be done um, and give her understanding of the negotiations. So, Senator McEwen, allow me to bring up a witness. Um, Ms. Glumek, if you'd step forward. Uh, members, our hope here is to give you the best possible picture of where we are today and with that to color your vote for better or for worse on sending the bill to agriculture. Um, once we have the testimony, then we'll have the vote on sending the bill out and we'll move on in our agenda. Ms. Glumick, thank you very much for coming forward. Uh, just looking for a brief description of Minnesota Rural Electric Association, the negotiations, and anything else you want to share with the committee about the progress you've made and to Senator Matthews' point, the progress yet to be made. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Senator Matthews, thank you for uh, having me. Jenny Glumack, Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Rural Electric Association. Uh, we have had um, discussions yesterday with uh, all six of our broadband CEOs uh, and uh, Layuna, and um, I feel like we're making um, some progress. That being said, we don't have an agreement as of yet. Um, I have been... Uh, told by uh, Senator McEwen, by Layuna, by Mr. Chair, that and the um, Chair of uh, uh, Chair Putnam, that this bill um, will not uh, get to the finish line unless we have an agreement. So um, I trust that that will uh, happen in the next uh, few days. And that's uh, the progress that we have made. Thanks, Unless Glumick. you want me to go into detail, Mr. Chair. But. No, I appreciate that. I think um, that's the, the short answer to the question of the member. Um, since you're back at the testifier's table, do we have members who would like to ask any further questions or make further comment? Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, I appreciate that update. Um, at least it uh, uh, gives us a roadmap of what we're trying to shoot for today. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to make a motion uh, that the bill be passed to agriculture without recommendation. Uh, and we'll still ask for a roll call on that motion. Thank you. Senator Matthews moves that Senate file 4742 be sent to the Senate Committee on Agriculture without recommendation. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. The uh, uh, clerk will now take the roll. Senator Friends? No. Senator Zhang? No. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Dibble? No. Senator Green? No. Senator Grunhagen? No. Senator Hoffman? <laughs> Senator Klein? No. Senator Lucero? No. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Mitchell? No. Senator Port? No. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Weber? No. Senator Hoffman? No. With zero yes votes and 14 no votes, the motion to send the bill to the Agriculture Committee without recommendation is not adopted. Um, members, back before us is the motion to send the bill to Agriculture with a recommendation to pass. Further comments or motions or uh, commentary from members? And I'm sorry, uh, Senator Matthews, roll call is requested. Roll call is granted to the motion. Senator McEwen, any final comments before we put the bill uh, to the vote? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members, for the good discussion. I just will say what a pleasure it is to work with all of the stakeholders involved in this discussion. And um, I uh, just appreciate them so much approaching these dis these discussions about the content of the bill in such good faith. And um, I believe that we're going to get there. So I respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. With that, um, Senator Zhang moves that Senate file 4742 be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate Committee on agriculture as amended. Uh, roll call has been requested. The clerk will take the roll. 
Senator Friends? Yes. Senator Zhang? Yes. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Green? No. Senator Grunhagen? No. Senator Hoffman? Yes. Senator Klein? Yes. Senator Lucero? No. Senator McEwen? Yes. Senator Mitchell? Yes. Senator Bort? Yes. Senator Rarick? Senator Weber? No. Senator Rarick? With eight yes votes and six no votes, Senate file 4742 and the motion to send it to agriculture is adopted. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Thank you, members. We'll now Thank go you. to the next item on the agenda, which is Senate file 4562, Senator Rarick. Members, the bill before us is Senator Rarick's 4562, a Senate file on fuel switching improvement achievement modifications. Senator Rarick, welcome to your committee. Um, please introduce the bill. You got the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senate file 4562 is a, a bill to do some modifications to the eco bill that we did a, a couple of years ago. Uh, it is meant to uh, address some issues that some of our utility companies have uh, seen as they have gone through their first uh, plan making process uh, for the eco bill. Um, I know there have been some questions asked, you know, we're, we're just seeing some of these plans implemented now. Why now? It's because these are addressing um, the process they go through to do those plans, which they have done already. And so they've seen that first round and where some of the issues are. And so that's what this is looking to address as they're going to develop um, follow-up plans to those. Um, Mr. Chair, I do have a couple of amendments that I would like to offer, and I would like to start with the A2. Senator Rarick offers the A2 amendment. While we're, while we're passing the amendment out, Senator... Uh, members, I'm sorry, that should be in your packets, the A2 amendment. Senator Rarick, to the A2. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The A2 amendment is an author's amendment. Uh, it was also adopted in the other body. Um, as the, the initial rollout of the bill came forward, there were a few issues that were addressed. Um, some of these uh, were requested by the Department of Commerce to ensure that uh, like uh, one part is to ensure that incentives were in conjunction with uh, weatherization services. Um, another was to limit some of the new provisions that were put in place uh, for third party organizations. And um, another one was some language that uh, they didn't agree with for DRGs that the uh, coalition had agreed to and so that is being removed. So uh, kind of a technical amendment uh, and that's the explanation of it. Um, thank you, Senator Rarick. Members, any questions for the author on the A2 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of adoption of the A2 say aye. aye. All opposed? The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Rarick to the bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, next, I would like to offer the A3 amendment. Senator Rarick offers the A3 amendment. Uh, that two members is in your packets. Senator Rarick to the A3 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this is a, an amendment that I would ask uh, members to support. Um, I see this also as an author's amendment, but wanted to deal with this uh, separately. Um, these are provisions that uh, I want to see put in uh, the bill to uh, alleviate some of my concerns and from concerns that I've seen uh, 
been heard from from other areas. So the first part, uh, page two, lines 26 to 29, that would eliminate uh, new language that was put in place that would allow utilities to spend to promote efficient fuel switching. I agree 100% that the utilities should be able to work with customers and count fuel switching towards their SIP goals, um, but I do not want to see them aggressively uh, advertising and promoting that. Um, that is not what we intended or what I intended uh, to do to our delivered fuels um, when we did the original bill. Um, the second, the other three lines uh, refer to um, some an elimination of the cap on spending for both the IOUs and the COUs, and so this language uh, removes that those caps and, and keeps those in place. So, uh. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Uh, members, questions for the author on the A3 amendment. I want to give Senator Rarick a uh, thank you for um, acknowledging that this is essentially an author's amendment that we would normally want the bill to be in the shape the author intended. Having said that, it obviously is an amendment that deserves some discussion. So thank you for that, Senator, for going through the front door on that. We'll take member questions or comments now. Senator Matthews to the A3 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Rarick, I've told you that I'm going to support your intent to get the bill the way you want it. Um, I'm being thrown off a little bit by the bill, line 2.26, has the word excluding. And so I want to do a double check to make sure that you're doing what you want to do instead of doing the opposite of what you want to do. It almost reads to me like the new language that's in the lines is already saying it's excluding uh, advertising for fuel switching programs. So would deleting that language then be allowing it is what I'm asking the author and council to help verify. Um, thank you, Senator Matthews. Why don't we give Senator Rarick a shot at that first. Um, Senator Rarick, if you want to tackle that, we can have council comment as well. Um, but first, bite at the apple, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I believe under the, the subdivision eight, um, where they're that's advertising expense, um, that the original bill, you know, allowed part of it, but that's where we had the cap. Um, this language, along with uh, eliminating the cap, did away with that, and so we're, we're eliminating that language to go back to the way the bill was, which would indeed then have a cap on spending. Thank you, Senator Eric. Senator Matthews, some further conversation? Back Mi to you. Mr. Chair, I think I found the other double negative on 2.17, so... I guess double negative is the other theme of the day here, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, so thank you. That, uh, that answers my question. Okay, we're not going to go to council then. Senator Matthews, you're satisfied. Um, members, other questions for Senator Rarick on the A3? Seeing none, final comments to the A3, Senator Rarick? All right. Uh, members, all those in favor of adopting the A3 amendment say aye. aye. All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Rarick, to your bill now as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to offer uh, one more amendment. Um, this is the A1 amendment. I believe members also have that one. Members, that should be in your packet. Senator Rarick, to the A1 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, this is one I, I've made in uh, talking with uh, some folks. Um, I'm not going to approach this one as an author's amendment, but I will say this is an amendment I would ask uh, members to consider. I, I would like to see this on as the Senate position uh, for the bill moving forward. Um, through a PUC decision, Otter Tail Power and Minnesota Power have an exemption on pumping stations. And GRE is looking for that same exemption, and that's what this bill would do. And ultimately, the reason they're looking for the exemption is these pumping stations are high electric users uh, with no efficiencies that can be found uh, with what we know, and we don't envision uh, abilities to find efficiencies. So ultimately, what would happen is if, when these are put in on the system, all of the other customers have to come up with those efficiencies to meet their uh, goals through the CIP program. So we're asking that this be excluded for GRE like it is um, for some, our other um, IOUs so that they don't have to 
get the other customers uh, to find those efficiencies. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Uh, members, the A1 amendment is before us. Senator Dibble. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Senator Rarick, um, thank you for giving us a little heads up and a little running start on this. I appreciate that. Gave me the opportunity to think about it a little bit, talk to some folks. Um, and uh, I understand the argument, um, and it may be a really good one, but it's hard to know because it does have a lot of implications and it does kind of set a precedent. Um, and that's what I worry about with the A1. Um, you know, there may be a, a company that purchases a number of industrial uh, businesses that cross the territory of, of an array of co-ops. Um, and they may be, you know, high energy consumers and it'd be hard for smaller co-ops to exclude those sales um, or include those sales for the purpose of reaching their, their percentage uh, conservation efficiency goals. Um, and, and so, you know, that, and that also might be a good idea, but we're kind of stepping down a path in which we need to really consider um, setting up precedent like this. And, and I would love to consider this matter in the context of a separately jacketed and introduced bill um, so that we could really put this subject in front of us, uh, you know, and, and really give it the consideration. The other point, Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, I'd like to raise is, um, you know, I was uh, the chief author of the first kind of iteration of SIP modernization, and you were the author of the second iteration, which we now call ECO. Um, and that was the work of, of, a, of many years and a, a lot of conversation. Um, and, and this seems to be ripe for that kind of broader consensus building collaboration. So I don't know if you have a response to any of that. You don't have to respond to it, but those are the issues that I bring to this A1 amendment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble, uh, for the comments. Senator Rarick, I think he's asking any response. Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for those comments. Like I said, I, I think we're following um, some of the other precedents that are already there. Again, uh, this uh, same exemption is uh, there for Otter Tail and for Minnesota Power. And then we also have a provision in the underlying bill that will exempt these uh, data mining facilities that are high energy users um, that, you know, using crypto. Um, again, another facility that uh, uses a lot of power. Uh, we're seeing more and more of them um, come up and, you know, we're trying to promote them to come to our state. They are jobs. Um, and we're exempting that as well because there's just no efficiencies to be found in that type of equipment with the technology that we have today. So, um, I appreciate your comments, I, but I still think, um, I believe this is a good provision that should be included in this bill. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Senator Dibble? Mr. Chair, may I request a roll call? Roll call is requested. Roll call will be granted. Other um, comments or questions for the author of the A1 amendment, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you. I, I also want to extend my thanks to you, Senator Rarick, for um, t giving us a heads up about this amendment and uh, the thoughtful way in which you're bringing it forward and, and talking about your view on why it's needed. Um, the fairness issue does really resonate with me in terms of the co-ops versus our investor-owned utilities. And... Um, I, I'm certainly interested in talking with you further about how we can address that issue in particular. I certainly don't want rate payers to be saddled with a burden um, getting their energy from co-ops that, for example, my constituents in Duluth getting their energy from Minnesota Power wouldn't have. So I'd, I'd like to talk with you about that further and if there's ways we could get creative about that. But um, I share Senator Dibble's concerns about the sort of slippery slope that this opens up uh, in terms of if we, if we provide these exceptions like this, where does it stop? Um, I, I, I'm concerned about that. And I also am just very concerned also, I, in, in my community up in, in my district of Duluth, um, line three was just um, brutal. Uh, the fight over line three, the, the debates over it, the split within various communities of what it represents. Um, I wouldn't be able to support any sort of exemption um, from our 
from our clean energy goals um, because of line three. Um, I, I, there's just no way that I could ever do that. Um, but I, um, and I'm, I'm wondering specifically, do you know in your look at what the effect of this amendment will have, um, how much less investment in energy efficiency and efficient fuel switching will occur if this amendment is adopted? Do you, and if you don't have that, that's okay. I just wonder if you do and if, um, again, I'd love to have conversation with you going forward. I can't support it right now, but yeah. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Uh, we're going to go to Senator Port. Do you want any response to Senator McEwen, Senator Rarick? Um, I'll just say I don't, off the top of my head, I don't have anything here in front of me that could give me those numbers, um, but we could definitely work with GRE to see if they have some calculations as to how much uh, energy um, they anticipate is used by those stations to understand what, uh, what we're looking at for that 1.5% that they would need to send on and get those efficiencies from other customers. Thank you, Senator Rarick. We're going to go now to Senator Port. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick, um, for you know being willing to talk about these issues. I think uh, you know Senator Dibble, the kind of sort of broad coalition uh, that he brought, and then that you continued to engage to get Eco passed in the first place, was really um, a testament to having those hard conversations and, and making sure we got to a point where everyone at the table was at least okay with where we were, if not everybody thrilled. Um, and I think my biggest concern with adopting this amendment is I think this is probably not in that same place um, and that there is probably significant uh, communities who would have real trouble with um, sort of a carve out specifically, particularly for something associated with line three. Um, so I don't think I can support it today, but I do think it's an interesting conundrum and I, I think it's something that's worth figuring out a path around. I'd be happy to continue to work with you um, on an individual bill on it, but I don't support um, sort of including it with the eco package as it is. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Rarick, any response? Um, I would just say, you know, remind members, um, this is, a, you know, I would like to see this uh, go in as the chief author, knowing that this is not, has not been adopted in the other body and we'll have to continue negotiating that piece. So there will be continued conversations as to how it will look in the final bill. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Members, other comments or questions for the author on the A1 amendment? A roll call has been requested. A roll call has been granted. Going once, going twice. Senator Rarick, any final comments to the A1 before we put it to a vote? No, no, Mr. Chair. Hang on a sec, members. All right. Um, members, the clerk will take the roll. Senator Friends? No. Senator Zhang? No. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Dibble? No. Senator Green? Yes. Senator Grunhagen? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Yes. Senator Klein? Senator Lucero? Yes. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Mitchell? No. Senator Port? No. Senator Rarick? Yes. Senator Weber? Members, there being seven yes votes and seven no votes, the amendment is not adopted. Senator Rarick to the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, again, this bill, um, as amended, is a bill that uh, has been brought forward by Electric Utilities, uh, some modifications to the ECO bill, um, modifications that they are requesting after going through their first plans to 
um, see some things that they need that would make it easier in working with the Commission and the Department of Commerce. Um, I can go through the bill uh, kind of section by section or we could go right to testifiers and then uh, I can go through areas of the bill if members have questions, whichever uh, the committee prefers uh, to take to meet the time. I know we've been running long. Um, well, we have time. Senator Rarick, I appreciate that. Are there members who want Senator Rarick to go through any particular parts of the bill? The motion is to send it to the floor, if members are wondering. Further commentary, I think we're good for now, Senator Rarick. Senator Rarick um, moves that Senate file 4562 be uh, recommended to pass and sent to the floor as amended. Uh, except for that we have testifiers and they're gonna come forward now. <laughs> Mr. Dufferin, we had so much drama over the amendment, Senator Rarick, that we forgot that part. Um, Mr. Dufferin, welcome back to the committee. Uh, folks, we have at best about 20, 25 minutes left that we can stretch this committee to and other bills to hear, so I'd ask the testifiers if we can do a minute and a half to two minutes, that would be great. Having heard the amendments, Mr. Dufferin, please introduce yourself. Welcome back to the committee and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, thanks, Senator Rarick, for bringing this bill forward and for your leadership on the 2021 ECO Act. Um, and much like that year, we have a large coalition that supports this bill. Uh, what we've learned through the first set of ECO plans is that it's largely working. It maintains our nation-leading energy efficiency programs and cost-effective investments. It opens new opportunities for more demand response and it encourages efficient fuel switching when new technologies such as air source heat pumps and heat pump water heaters give customers a better choice. We also learned in talking to a whole variety of stakeholders uh, over the interim here that we could improve on the eco-regulatory process and therefore future eco plans. For instance, we could streamline efficient fuel switching tests so that utilities, particularly our smaller utilities, could easily meet the regulatory burden. This simplification is further warranted now because of your decision last year to put electric utilities on a path to 100% carbon-free energy. To ensure that our electric utilities are partners in helping us bring more federal resources home, this bill includes a new efficient fuel switching goal for electric investor-owned utilities. Better motivating our electric utilities to add efficient load to periods of less demand which is really what ECO ends up facilitating, is critical to growing the, the market for home electrification and the related jobs and federal rebates and tax credits to Minnesotans. Uh, Mr. Chair, I for, forgot to introduce myself. My name is Chris Dufferin. I'm president of Center for Energy and Environment. Thank you for bringing this, uh, this bill forward, Senator Rarick. Th thank you, Mr. Dufferin. Next, we'll have Louise Miltich from Department of Commerce. Assistant Commissioner Miltich, if you could please come forward. Welcome back to the committee. If you don't mind, please introduce yourself again and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon. My name for the record is Louise Miltich. I serve as Assistant Commissioner of Regulatory Affairs at the Minnesota Department of Commerce within the Division of Energy Resources. I'm here today in support of Senate file 4562, I'll thank Senator Rarick for his work as chief author of the ECO Act and for bringing forward these important updates. The department provides regulatory oversight of the ECO program and is extremely proud of the program's achievements to date. The program is routinely recognized by the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy as one of the best in the nation. The passage of the 2021 ECO Act has provided a framework from which to expand these efforts. Since the passage of the ECO Act, department staff, as has been referenced a couple times today, have been working with stakeholders to implement programs under the new framework, and the department is very excited about new programs that are being implemented by Minnesota utilities. First, XL Gas and Electric Centerpoint and Ottertail have all included efficient fuel switching programs in their 2024 to 2026 triennial plans. Their programs include incentives to switch to electric air source heat pumps, electric outdoor equipment, electric vehicles, and electric vehicle charging. Great River Energy and Conexus have also included efficient fuel switching programs incentivizing air source heat pumps. Second, XL and Ottertail have included load management programs in their eco portfolios to help manage peak demand. 
XL and Otter Tail expect to achieve 101 megawatts and 61 megawatts of demand reduction, respectively. So while significant progress has been made since the passage of the ECO Act, the department understands that adjustments are necessary and important as ECO continues to evolve. The department believes that Senate File 4562 provides such necessary adjustments by modifying the efficient fuel switching criteria, removal, removing the efficient fuel switching spending cap, and allowing for an electric investor-owned utility efficient fuel switching financial incentive. These changes, along with others contained in the bill, will provide necessary impetus for increased utility efforts that dovetail with new state and federal initiatives, maximizing Minnesota's drive toward a clean energy future. So in sum, the department supports Senate File 4562, and we look forward to answering any questions you might have for the department. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miltich. Um, next, we'll have Kent Suum from MMUA on deck, Katie Fry from Minnesota Power. Mr. Suum, if you could please come forward. Mr. Sulem, welcome back to the committee. Could you please introduce yourself and present your testimony? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ken Sulem, Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. I'll be very brief. Thank you, Senator Rourke, for agreeing to author this tweaking of the uh, ECO bill. We specifically asked for what's now sections three and five of the bill uh, regarding um, crypto mining, as you heard earlier. Uh, we worked closely with a number of stakeholders to come up with a very, very narrow definition of those that would be exempted from uh, being in the SIP goals for the uh, uh, COUs based on the fact that there are simply no efficiencies to be had with these uh, operations. We also are asking for Section 6 of the bill, which is not, as it would read, a reduction in SIP obligations, but a restoration of what it always had been for municipal gas uh, operations. They had a 1% savings goal, not a 1.5. However, when we crafted the original ECO Act, somehow it was overlooked and in the shuffling of language, it ended up being 1.5 instead of one, uh, which is also the savings goal for the IOU. So uh, that's our request. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sula. Nice to see you again. Um, next, we'll have Katie Fry from Minnesota Power and on deck, Dave Wager from the Minnesota Propane Association. Ms. Fry, please come forward and present your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair, friends, and members of the committee. I'm Katie Fry, Manager of Customer Programs and Services at Minnesota Power. We are proud that Minnesota Power has exceeded the state's energy savings goal for 14 consecutive years, helping our customers save energy and money. Today we appreciate the opportunity to provide our comments in support of Senate File 4562. We want to thank Senator Rarick for his continued leadership on ECO and for bringing this important bill forward this session. I also want to thank the ECO Coalition members, some of whom you've heard of and some of whom you'll hear from soon. Um, for their work on this effort. Similar to the Eco Bill in 2021, this bill is a collaborative effort amongst a broad group of stakeholders. Minnesota Power supports Eco and energy policy that gives customers more access and choice to both save money and energy in their homes and businesses if they so choose. The original Eco Bill made several positive improvements to Minnesota's nation leading conservation programs. As we work to implement the 2021 ECO law, there were a few areas in the program that would benefit from further streamlining. Today's bill provides targeted updates that will further enhance ECO and we urge you to support it. Again, we greatly appreciate Senator Rarick's leadership on these important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spry. Next, Mr. Wager on deck, uh, Joe Dammel from Fresh Energy. Sir, welcome back to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. All right, Mr. Chairman, members, I'm Dave Wager, Executive Director of the Minnesota Propane Association. I'd like to thank Senator Rarick for working with our industry on this bill, and we look forward to continuing our conversations addressing our concerns. In 2021, the ECO Act was passed with guardrails 
uh, to meet its conservation goals. In 2023, carbon electricity by 2040 was passed. In 2024, it's become apparent that stakeholders will not be able to obtain requirements of these bills. Senate File 4562 removes some of the guardrails established and appears to us as being an anti-propane bill. Our concerns include but are not limited to the following. Lines 4.1 to 4.4, stricken from the bill, allowing increased emissions that count towards energy conservation. Line 8.28 strikes using a full fuel cycle energy analysis. This deletion will increase emissions as it does not account for the energy needed to produce electricity. Lines 15.26 to 15.33 allow for fuel switching based on the improvements the utility expects to achieve. It doesn't consider the expected improvements of the fuel it replaces. Renewable propane is available and being used in the United States today. Renewable propane blends with conventional propane at any percentage, meaning we do not need any new infrastructure, equipment, or new appliances. Recently, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation assessed the amount of generation that will be available to, uh, compared to the projected demand for electricity and highlighted concerns about the risk of outages due to insufficient generation as utilities grapple with challenges to transition to new energy sources. Quote, this report is a serious reminder that decisions we make today will impact our power reliability tomorrow, Derek Moe, CEO of the Minnesota Rural Electric Association, said. According to the report, a large portion of the continent, including Minnesota, is at risk in the winter months if the weather is severe. In a state like Minnesota, having reliable power during dangerously cold winter weather can mean life or death, end quote. We need to ensure that propane is integral to our energy mix. According to the EPA, propane is almost three times more efficient than electricity. So instead of hiding emissions and making allowances not to meet the 2040 carbon-free goal, we need to evaluate and resolve the likely consequences before experiencing them. Inefficient fuel switching and emissions exemptions will not solve anything. Minnesotans, especially rural Minnesotans, need reliable energy and access to all forms of energy at an affordable price. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Wager, and thank you also for your work on buses. I appreciate a lot of the conversation we've had. You've got a good author here. I appreciate the reference to additional conversations as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our last witness is Joe Dammel from Fresh Energy. Mr. Dammel, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joe Dammel and I am the Managing Director of Buildings at Fresh Energy. Uh, Fresh Energy is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based here uh, in Minnesota, and we appreciate the opportunity to testify on uh, our support for Senate File 4562 as amended. And I want to thank uh, Senator Rarick for the work uh, that you've done uh, to get this bill uh, where it's at, and also uh, thank the members of the coalition uh, for the hard work on the bill. Uh, the, this bill provides critical updates to ECO, which passed in 2021 with bipartisan support and was endorsed by a wide range of stakeholders, including Fresh Energy. Uh, since passage of ECO, Fresh Energy has worked with members of the Department of Commerce and other stakeholders to implement uh, ECO, and we've had the opportunity to review the first plans that utilities filed in 2021, or 2023, excuse me. Uh, and while utilities did make strides in their first efficient fuel switching programs in these most recent eco plans, it became clear to us that they could and should do more to maximize these important programs. The provisions in this bill will remove barriers to the deployment of efficient fuel switching measures and programs and will allow utilities to maximize the benefit of complementary policies from both the state and federal levels. Uh, I'll keep this short, so we urge you to support uh, Senate file 4562 as amended, uh, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Dammel. Members, that's all the testifiers we have on our list. Any members of the public who wish to come forward to testify? Seeing none, we're going to go to member questions. Senator Grunhagen, before I go to you, uh, members, just a heads up. We're at the end of our two hours of committee. It is the chair's hope that we can finish this agenda by 3 o'clock when the Agriculture Committee comes in here. I understand we have members who have a lot of questions, but hopefully we can expedite with that. Um, briefly, Senator Grunhagen. I'll keep it brief. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and, uh, you know, just a general comment. I found uh, Mr. Wagers uh, from the Minnesota Propane Association testimony quite compelling, to tell you the truth. You know, members, just a general comment. 
uh, and it applies to this bill too, to a certain degree. You know, we keep switching more and more stuff to our electrical grid, and we do it at a time when we're undermining the base load electricity and the efficiency and the cost of our electricity. I mean, it, it's not clean energy. It's going to, when we have to clean these solar panels and wind up, it's going to be the biggest environmental disaster in the history of the state of Minnesota. And, you know, the last thing, you know, sometimes I, I you know, not long ago I read the story, The Emperor Has No Clothes. And I encourage everyone to read it. And everybody was saying the emperor had clothes when he didn't have clothes. And he paid a lot of money to have no clothes. Finally, a little child said, you know what? The emperor doesn't have any clothes. It shook the whole area. There are times in this committee that I believe we're living out the story of the emperor has no clothes. And I wish we'd get back to reality. And I find the testimony of the Minnesota Propane Association quite compelling. Thank you, Mr. Chair and M. Everett. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. We'll get an A plus for a reference. Um, having said that, members, any further questions for the author before we go to final comments? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Rarick, can you just uh, let us know, uh, will, this, will this bill impact propane costs, and do you have any idea how much? Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would ask um, that we would pose that to uh, Mr. Wager. Um, I, that's not an answer I would have any ability to, uh, to answer, but I would, I would love to turn it over to Mr. Wager to get his thoughts on that question. Senator Green, you want us to ask Mr. Wager to come back up? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wager, if you don't mind returning to the testifier's table. I'm going to paraphrase Senator Green, Mr. Wager, by saying um, any further testimony that you want to offer on costs. All right, Mr. Chair, Senator. You know, cost is an unknown, just like it is with anything else, but propane needs base load power, just or base load, just like electricity needs base load. So our members need transportation space on pipeline, rail, trucks, things like that. So we start losing base load. We lose space on pipelines, trucks, our members shed assets, and things will become more expensive. We have less deliveries to offset the costs and spread them out. So it's just a matter of time that I'm sure costs will go up. And then the other thing I want to add to that is Minnesota always seems to be the energy for emergency situations. Uh, winter storm urine 2021, enough propane was delivered in Minnesota to heat 6,000 homes for a year, and that propane was delivered to backup systems for electricity and natural gas. If you take away our base load, you're going to take away our ability to help in the future. Thank you, Mr. Wager. Senator Green, is that good? All right. Members, other Comments, questions before we go to Senator Rarick for final comments on the bill as amended. Seeing none, Senator Rarick, final comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the time today in committee uh, to talk about this. Um, I am going to. Uh, I'm a little. I'm a little disappointed. Uh, my one amendment didn't go on. I want to work on that here. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I would make a motion that we lay Senate File 4562 on the table so that I can work on that and bring it back before this committee. Senator Rarick moves that Senate File, which I have right in front of me, 4562 be laid on the table as amended. Senate File 4562 laid on the table as amendment. As amended, uh, all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion is approved. The bill is laid on the table. Thank you, Thank you Senator Rarick. All right, again, members, we're hoping to move through our agenda. And our next bill is Senator McEwen, 4687. Um, we have one testifier in each of the next two bills, ladies and gentlemen, so hopefully we'll be able to successfully hear the matters at hand. Senator McEwen, welcome back to the committee. Please present your bill. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Chair friends, uh, members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present Senate File 4687, which would create a working group at the Public Utilities Commission to examine regulatory issues surrounding the deployment of thermal energy networks by our regulated gas utilities. Three years ago, this legislature passed the Bipartisan Natural Gas Innovation Act, which was authored by our very own Senator Weber. That bill authorized natural gas utilities to develop innovation plans and deploy innovative resources to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the building sector on a pilot basis. One of these resources was thermal energy networks, or district energy systems, which heat and cool a series of buildings through a series of interconnected pipes with liquid in them, which pull heat from under the ground. Both CenterPoint and Excel Energy have proposed these types of systems in their initial plans. Other utilities around the state, including the city of Duluth, are working on similar projects. My bill builds on this work by convening a working group to discuss how regulated utilities can deploy these systems going forward in the regulated context. My bill doesn't authorize any new projects. It simply brings together different stakeholders to learn about these systems and produce a report outlining considerations, outlining considerations for future deployment. My bill has support from a wide array of stakeholders, including public utilities, unions, clean energy advocates, and consumer advocates. And um, with that, uh, Chair Friends, I would stand for any questions, and I believe we have a, one test fired. Thank you very much for that, Senator McHugh, and I believe we have Mr. Charles Sutton as our testifier. And we had listed an, we had listed an author's amendment. Senator we McHugh. do, yes. Thank you very much. I do have an A1 author's amendment to get the bill in a shape that I am already talking about it. Senator McEwen offers the A1 amendment. Members, any questions to the A1 amendment for Senator McEwen? It's being handed out. It's being handed out. You probably thought it was in your packets, but no. Senator McEwen, do you want to address the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's not really much to, I, I don't actually have much to say. That it, it just gets it in the, the condition that we want it in. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Members, after seeing the amendment, any questions for the author? If not, all in favor of adopting the A1 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? The A1 is adopted. Senator McEwen, um, if we're ready to have Mr. Sutton testified to the bill as amended. Mr. Sutton, please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Chair friends, members of the committee, uh, my name is Charles Sutton. I'm here today on behalf of my client GeoExchange, a trade organization representing the geothermal heat pump industry. Um, I'm not going to uh, know we're short on time, so I'll just be really quick. Uh, you know, this obviously, uh, this bill just creates a work group over at the PUC. Uh, you know, as we're looking at exciting opportunities like these thermal energy networks uh, to look at to take geo or connected geothermal systems and use them to heat and cool buildings across entire neighborhoods. You know, it's exciting that we're moving forward with pilots, uh, but you know, once we're, we're done with pilots, you know, we really need to answer some of these questions about how this would work in the regulated context. So uh, thanks, Senator McEwen, for bringing this bill forward and, uh, and would encourage the members to support it. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Sutton, for your informative and concise testimony. <laughs> Any members of the public that want to come forward and testify before we go to member questions? Seeing none, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to ask a question uh, that I asked this morning. You know, we talked about uh, pilot projects that are already in place. Um, is this something, I know you've bumped out the date uh, till December 31st of 2025, um, but are we convening this a uh, little early for seeing information that's coming from uh, these pilot programs, or are, you know, what are your thoughts on on when we're going to start this and will information be available uh, for the group to make good decisions yet. Thank you, Senator Rarick, Senator McEwen, or to your testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will ask my testifier to address that excellent Mr. question. Sutton. Yeah, thank you, Senator Eric. We, we talked about this this morning, and, uh, you know, originally we had actually had a shorter amount of time, and, and based on some feedback from uh, some stakeholders, including from uh, Centerpoint, sort of bumped it out uh, to ra essentially wrap up the stakeholder group by December 31st, 2025. I think with NGIA, we're expecting the first tranche of projects uh, to be approved uh, 
sometime over the summer, I believe, is is around the time that the PUC will be there. So, you know, we'll start to have some information. We certainly won't have all information about deployment, but I think we'll have enough to start looking at, um, you know, that regulatory structure. And certainly we'll be able to look to some other states and some pilots that are ongoing there and some work that they've done sort of shaping that regulatory structure. Thanks, Mr. Sutton. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, want to say, too, this is another group that's getting a uh, a stakeholder group put together. Uh, I sure hope we can uh, be looking at that for permit reform as well for many of our other sectors. Thanks, Senator Rarick. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a brief question for the author. We set up working groups all the time for a myriad of reasons. Why do we need legislation for this one? Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that question, Senator Matthews. Um, um, honestly, I... I, I don't know as as compares why we need a specific working group for this as compared to other ones uh, or other sectors and areas, but um, I uh, have been convinced uh, by the proponents and the coalition around this bill that a working group would be very helpful uh, in this area in particular. Um, but I would ask uh, perhaps my testifier, uh, Mr. Sutton, has something else to offer in, in uh, response to your question. Briefly, Mr. Sutton. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Um, I agree that I think the public utilities probably could you know, if they wanted to move this forward on their own initiative, I, I wouldn't want to say for certain, but they probably could. Um, but I know the legislature often takes a step of saying, you know, this is something we actually really do want you to see, to do, to to look at it. And given that this is, a, you know, an issue that we're, we're just coming down the road and, you know, one of the options for reducing uh, carbon in uh, the, the building sector uh, thought it was worthwhile. Senator Matthews. All right. Further comments, questions? It is the intention to lay the bill over. Seeing none, any final comments, Senator McEwen, before they lay the bill over? No, I uh, respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator McEwen. With that, Senate File 4687 is laid over. Members will now go to Senate File 4740, Senator Klein. Hey, Senator Klein. Chair and committee, thank you for hearing Senate File 4740, a request for funds from the Minnesota Renewable Development Account to assist Dakota County in becoming carbon free. County's uh, energy efficiency proposal includes installing a total of 875 kilowatts of solar panels at three county locations, converting indoor lighting to LED bulbs at 14 buildings, and making energy efficient HVAC updates at the Northern Service Center. Mr. Chair, I have a testifier. Uh, thank you, Senator Klein. I also have an amendment on my agenda here. Senator Klein, do you want to offer the um, A1 amendment? Members, I offer the A1 amendment, which simply changes the dollar amount of the request from $8.5 uh, million to $7 million. Thank you. Senator Klein offers the A1 amendment. Uh, members, the amendment is being handed out. Simply a change in the request. Are there any member questions for Senator Klein on the A1 amendment? Senator Grunhagen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Why are we going from eight and a half to seven million? Senator Grunhagen, I'm assuming that question is for the uh, author, but author. perhaps you want to go to the testifier who will have to introduce himself. Nope. Mr. Chair, Senator Grunhagen, we don't typically take questions on an author's amendment, but I'll address this one. Uh, this is addressing scaling the request from uh, an initial apportionment down to the funding that is uh, confined to XL Energy uh, coverage area within the county of Dakota. Thank you, Senator Klein. Senator Grunhagen, good for you. Members, other questions? Um, we have a testifier, Commissioner Atkins, if you could please introduce yourself. Welcome back. Can you vote on the A1, sir? What I was just going to say is, is uh, Commissioner Atkins' testimony to the A1 um, or to the bill as amended? To the bill as amended, Mr. Chair. All right, let's do the A1. Members, all in favor of adopting the A1 amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The A1 is adopted. Uh, Mr. Commissioner Atkins, please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, committee staff. My name is Joe Atkins. I'm on the Dakota County Board. I'm, this year I'm serving as chair of the Dakota County Board. I want to thank Senator Klein with, a test or with an author like that who needs a testifier. He pretty much uh, uh, shared the most important elements of the, uh, of the bill. Uh, I would note that we are not aware of any other county in Minnesota that has achieved a situation where they generate more electricity than they, than they use. Um, that is what this would accomplish. In fact, we're not aware of any other county in the country that generates more electricity than they use. Not only would we eliminate uh, $4.6 million of greenhouse gases 
we'd also uh, reduce by 25 percent our energy costs. Uh, with that, the one final piece that is not in your packets, this is the Prairie Island um, nuclear plant. This is Hastings, Mr. Chairman, uh, all within the 10-mile emergency zone, within the 25-mile zone, which is the evacuation zone, are the communities of Apple Valley, Invergrove Heights, Rosemont, Farmington, Egan, and uh, uh, West St. Paul, South St. Paul. Uh, with that, I'd uh, very much appreciate the support of the committee and yourself, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Members, questions for the testifier, Senator Grunhagen and then Senator Port. Senator Grunhagen. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, you know, Senator Klein, uh, you know I respect you, but you know whenever I say that, I always have a negative comment after that. No. You know, I mean, we've got 87 counties who probably have, a lot of them have similar, similar uh, concerns, and yet we're singling out just this county you know I it just uh, causes me pause and I'm not saying you don't have the need but uh, you know it, it it's to the exclusion your county to the exclusion of the rest of them and I you know they are, all ratepayers are paying into that RDA uh, XL at least that I'm aware of and yet we're singling out one county to get I think there's about, I was told about 19 million in the RDA account, and we're going to take 7 million of that and send it to one county. Provide me a rationale why that uh, treats everybody equally. Senator Grunhagen, let me take a stab at that. Um, the RDA account has to uh, provide energy efficiency and other qualifying projects within the XL service territory so that all of them are for part of the XL service territory. But I'm going to turn it over to Senator Klein for any further response. Senator Klein. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Grunhager. Senator Grunhager, you know that I respect you. Uh, but the truth is, this is the county with the plan. Uh, they're the county that has a plan uh, on the books, ready to go to carbon neutral. In fact, negative energy. They can produce more energy than they uh, utilize. Um, and if other counties have that plan and it's appropriate usage of the RDA, they should certainly come forward. Thank you, Senator Klein. Senator Grunhagen? Real quick follow-up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, is there any matching funds from the county that are going along with this? Senator Klein or perhaps Commissioner Atkins? Yep. Mr. Chairman, Senator Grunhagen, yes, we, we will have at least, uh, not matching funds, but we'll have over a million dollars of our own funds into this as well. Senator Grunhagen? Yeah, because, you know, and I just think of bonding, a lot of times it's a 50-50 split. And I guess I'd encourage the author, in light of the limited resources of the RDA and how it ne needs to be spread around to, to the counties that pay into it, that at least we'd move to a 50-50 split on this. I think it's reasonable. Dakota County is, uh, my understanding is economically is quite advanced compared to many other counties. So I would appreciate that uh, movement if at all possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Um, I have Senator Matthews on the list. And then, I'm sorry, Senator Matthews, I inadvertently leapfrogged Senator Port. Can I go to Senator Port first? Senator Port, then Senator Matthews. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Klein uh, and Commissioner, for bringing this bill. Um, Dakota County has long been a leader in this area, and the communities within it have really helped to make a plan for energy efficiency. Um, I am incredibly supportive of this. Senator Klein, I'd love to sign on, but I think uh, Dakota County continues to be a model for what other countries, uh, what other counties can look at um, to, to excel in this area. Um, really pleased to support this bill. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I have a question as to why the bill is crafted as appropriating to Dakota County rather than being just a proposal of the project to the RDA that we see uh, so often in other places. Like, is the county uh, is the county going to take 100% of the funds and use it in the project? So you're going to be holding back, you know, small administrative fees out of it. Uh, it just reads odd to me as it's appropriating to a county rather than to a specific project. Even if it's a project within a county, uh, I just like to dig in on why it's being appropriated uh, to one county. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Either Senator Klein or Commissioner Atkins. 
I'll let Commissioner Atkins, Chair and uh, Senator Matthews, I'll let Commissioner Atkins expand, but I guess I would say these are confined to county facilities, the county buildings and public buildings, and that's where the work is going to occur, and so the appropriate arbiter of those funds, in my opinion, would be the county, Senator Ac or Chair Atkins. Commissioner Mr. Atkins. Mr. Chairman, Senator Matthews, that's exactly right. There's uh, 14 county buildings. Uh, all of which will be either LED projects, and we were, we're doing our best to present it fairly rapidly, but we've got three solar projects, uh, three, uh, or three solar, 14 LED projects, and an HVAC project, all at county facilities. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Matthews, any follow-up? Yeah, so follow-up. Um, then is 100% of the funds going to the projects, or is there going to be costs, payments, reimbursements, administrative fees, anything that's going to be uh, peeled off of it uh, before getting uh, funded to the projects. Mr. Ch Commissioner Atkins. Mr. Chairman, Senator Matthews, we have no intention of peeling off anything. We, we, we intend to put it all towards this project. Senator Thanks Matthews. Again. Members, uh, the intention is to lay the bill over. Further questions for the author before we go for closing comments. Senator Klein, do you want to offer any closing comments? All right, thank you, Senator Klein. Thank you, Commissioner Atkins. With that, the bill is laid over. We are now going to go to Senate File 4760, Senator Mitchell, and I'm going to hand the gavel over to Senator Zhang. All right, uh, Senator Mitchell, to your bill. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Um, in the interest of everyone's time and with the clock kind of ticking, um, to my knowledge, all of the testifiers are in favor of this bill. Um, that includes everything from uh, faith groups to the CUB has a letter of support to environmental organizations. And what this bill does is it would modify the Natural Gas Innovation Act um, so that utilities of 800,000 or more, which would be, you know, the very large, um, would have uh, at least 15% of their costs working on thermal energy. So we're talking geothermal and ways to kind of expand um, the different types of energy opportunities that we look at. My understanding is a lot of um, the utilities of this size are already spending money in that realm on, geo, on, on some of these different new technologies. And this would also have the Department of Commerce conduct a study for the statewide deployment of this thermal energy in the networks and submit their findings and recommendations to the legislature. All right, and uh, do you also have an author's amendment too? Um, or no? Do, do you have me, show me having one? It's not in my packet. I'm sorry. I must have left it at my desk. Which, what is it? Oh, okay. Uh, I would like to offer the A1 amendment. All right. Um, with that, uh, Senator, Mit uh, Senator Mitchell moves the A1 amendment. This is uh, my first stop. First stop. Author's amendment. Um, would you like to add anything else to, to the amendment? Once you get a peek at no, if it's it's my first stop, if if we could consider adopting it okay. uh, just to get it in the order. Uh, Senator Mitchell moves the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Oh. The amendment is adopted. And uh, Senator Mitchell, do you have testifiers also? Uh, Senator um, Chair Zhang, uh, again... I believe we have five minutes left. If any of the testifiers really have to say their words, um, I would allow it. But as I said, all the testifiers, to my knowledge, are in support. And I'm just trying to be mindful right. of our time to not have to come back, whether it's tonight or Friday or anything else. All right. And, um, Mr. Severson? Please uh, state your name uh, for the record, and you may proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chuck Severson. I reside in North Mankato, and I'm one of Senator Frenz's constituents and a member of Isaiah. I'm a long time and still practicing electrical engineer. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today about the importance of you giving credence to this pilot geothermal network heating concept 
because it would be for the benefit of the state of Minnesota and help address my concerns that everyone have affordable, dignified, energy efficient homes that are powered by carbon free energy. I hold several patents in wind generator design dating back to the 70s and I have 20 additional patents. I have some 50 years of experience in what's been called alternative energy. I can recall standing at various podiums in the late 70s and 80s trying to sell the notion that we needed to do something serious about weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels and at times I was derided for doing so. And now we know that climate change is here and it's real. So today you're considering making a decision to move Minnesota forward in the direction of serious reduction in the use of fossil fuels, which we know results in the release of copious amounts of CO2 that continues to con contribute to climate change. So we need some serious systemic change to accomplish the goal. Thanks to the Minnesota legislature and Senator Frenz's personal interest, Minnesota has decided to take care of the energy supply by vowing to make Minnesota's electric utility industry carbon free by 2040. Now we've got an even bigger job, and that is to fix the energy use side of the equation, with heating and air conditioning being a huge part of that. There are, of course, other major things to be done in the area of transportation, agriculture, but one major thing we must and can do is to make heating and cooling rely on something other than fossil fuels. And that's where this notion of geothermal neighborhood networks fills in, fits in. <clears throat> this pilot program for geothermal neighborhood networks. Uh, Mr. Steven yeah. Severson, could you please? I got uh, about we're, 10 we're, seconds. We're, all right, thank you, sir. <laughs> that can solve both the carbon neutral requirement for housing and building, and in addition, make housing more affordable. We're late to the game. A lot of the rest of the world has been doing geothermal at a very high level. But thank you. We need this. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, uh, Senator Mitchell. Any members' uh, questions or comments on the bill? Seeing none, any f uh, one more testifier? Uh, if the testifiers could please keep it to like one minute, I, if I can ask that. Yes. Uh, please state your name uh, for the record, and you may proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Jamie Fitzke, Director of Government Affairs with Centerpoint Energy. Uh, just wanted to note that this technology is included in our current innovative resource plan, which was filed last June. Uh, at utility scale, this will be the first type uh, of, of its kind in a cold climate. So we really appreciate the enthusiasm for this technology, and we look forward to seeing the impacts and learning opportunities from NGI pilots and how network geothermal can be part of a safe, reliable, and affordable energy future. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any members' questions? Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just a quick question. We just passed, uh, or laid over, I guess, Utility Thermal Network Working Group. So now we're going with the Thermal Energy Network Project. Shouldn't we let the work group establish something first before we go to this bill? Or what are your thoughts? Uh, Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Grunhagen. Um, so again, this um, allocates some of the resources that in, in many ways are already being allocated to make sure we are actually actively starting to expand geothermal um, and study the process of geothermal. Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Okay. Well, thanks for that response. Just one other thing about uh, carbon. <laughs> you know, I just looked up on the internet, it says, the phenomenon is called carbon fertilization. An influx of carbon dioxide increases a plant's rates of photosynthesis, photosynthesis, which combines energy from the sun, water, nutrients from the ground and the air to produce fuel for life and spurs plant growth. So you, know, you need a little bit of carbon for green trees and, and flowers, all right? We don't want everything to be brown. So I think there are scientists who disagree with some of those comments, thank you. All right. Uh, any other members' uh, questions or comments? Senator Mitchell, any closing uh, comments? Thank you for considering this, and um, thank you for letting me hopefully get this in before our session ended. All right. And with that, uh, Senate file 4760 is laid over for possible inclusion. Oh. And...
with that, and there's no committee, no committee meetings on Monday, um, and we will hear the rest of the RDA bills on Wednesday. Thank you. And with that, committee is adjourned.